They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. Um, and these words have a kind of incantatory rhythms and mantra-like repetitions that are intoned every year on Remembrance Day. They're words that we hear but rarely see in print. We know them kind of more or less by heart. They seem not to have been written but have pulsed into life in the nation's collective memory to have been generated down the long passage of years by the hypnotic spell of remembrance that they are used to induce. But they were written, of course, by a chap called Lawrence Binion in September 1914, before the fallen actually fell. For the fallen, in other words, is a work not of remembrance, but of anticipation. Or more accurately, the anticipation of remembrance. A foreseeing that is also a determining. I appreciate that's a kind of quite a big concept. So what we're talking about here is this is written a long time before the mass slaughters on the Western Front. He's anticipating it. So we're going to listen to the first three stanzas of the poem. I was going to read it out, but then I found that there was a recording done by Sir John Gilgood. And uh, I can't really compete with that, can I? <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, so I'm going to let him do the recital for us. And what I want you to do is to just focus in and listen to the wording. Listen to the way that death is celebrated, to a degree glorified. And uh, the whole presentation, which is kind of... is presenting the idea of death as something glorious, something desirable. Spirit of her spirit, fallen in the cause of the free. Solemn the drums thrill, death august and royal, sings sorrow up into immortal spheres. There is music in the midst of desolation, and a glory that shines upon our tears. They went with songs to the battle, they were young, straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them. So this photo the anticipation of memory was taken on the 22nd of August at Pilcombe Ridge near Epes, Jim Passchendaele. And Ernest Brooks took this iconic photograph, one of the, perhaps the most iconic photograph of the Great War. Head bowed, rifle on his back, the soldier is silhouetted against the going down of the sun. Looking down, the grave a dead colleague, a comrade, remembering him. So this photograph from the Third Battle of Ypres kind of creates in our minds this sense of what remembrance is. The war at this point was still raging. As you can see, the grave, such as it is, is very crude indeed. Um, armistice 
at this stage was still some 15 months distance. But this photograph is the beginnings of how we're going to come to remember the war. The commemoration is a photograph of the future, of the future's view of the past, if that makes sense. And it's going to photograph, it seems to me, of Binion's poem. This is for the fallen, looked at through the frame of a photograph. So, this is footage now from the very first Armistice Day in 1919. At 11, on the 11th of November 1919, the two-minute silence was first introduced. At 11am, not only Britain, but throughout the Empire, all activity ceased. Traffic came to a standstill, and trains were stopped. Factories and workshops went quiet. You can see the scale of the gathering here, here in Whitehall. And so Edwin Lutyens had been asked to devise a temporary, non-denominational installation for the occasion. In a matter of hours, he sketched the design of what became the cenotaph. But the monument that you see here is made of wood and plaster. So this is the first public act of remembrance. The victory parade had been planned for July, but the Prime Minister opposed any plan for national celebration, which didn't include some celebration, tribute rather, to the dead. The discussion around memorials had got underway during the war, and one argument was that memorials would have a practical value. New hospitals, homes and universities were proposed. But the question was being asked was what was being memorialised? And generally people had very little clear idea of why the war had been fought or what it had accomplished except for the loss of millions of lives. The response was one word, sacrifice. So the anniversary of Armistice Day was chosen to memorialise not victory but sacrifice. The public response was enough to decide to commission an identical permanent version of the cenotaph made of Portland stone. So we see the soldiers now marching past huge crowds looking on. But the role of the army here is not to celebrate victory, but to represent the dead. This is a language of remembrance and the idea of sacrifice. The survivors are witnesses to the sacrifice. The role of the living is to offer you tribute, not to receive it. The soldiers marching past the cenotaph, in other words, comprise an army of the surrogate dead. In an effort to give some scale of the loss, the Imperial War Graves Commission pointed out that if the Empire's dead marched four abreast down Whitehall, it would take them three and a half days to pass the Cenotaph. Let's pause there. Um, so the line of soldiers kind of marching out of sight. They stretch out of sight for us, out of time, and it feels that if we trace the line back far enough, we'd find ourselves here, in the lines of the men marching away to the war. It's impossible now, I think, for us to watch these films of the soldiers marching, marching to the Battle of the Somme without our awareness of its terrible outcome. They appear as ghosts marching towards a slaughter, but the words of Binion, and inspired by the tragic explorer hero Scott, they march towards honourable death. So Scott was the hero of the day. Today we recognise his incompetence, but then it was seen as heroism. A 1916 newspaper proclaimed that the explorer Scott had given his countrymen an example of endurance. We have so many heroes among us now, so many Scots, holding sacrifice above gain, and we begin to understand what a splendour arises from the bloody fields of Flanders. So called to the glory of self-sacrifice, they marched. But by the time of the great battles of 1916 and 1917, mass graves were dug in advance of major offensives, and the singing columns of soldiers fell grimly silent as they marched these gaping pits en route to the front-line trenches. So the first of our drone films brings us to Ovillers 
military cemetery. So during the war, the dead were buried haphazardly, often in mass graves, but a more fitting resting place was needed. Immediately after the armistice work began on establishing the cemeteries as permanent memorials to the dead. And despite protests, it was decided there'd be no repatriation of bodies or private memorials. All the British and Empire soldiers would be buried or remain unburied where they fell. Undifferentiated by rank, uniform headstones would be used. Crosses, it was decided, were harder to maintain and were not compatible with other faiths. So every soldier achieves equality in death. The name of every soldier that died would be recorded either in the cemetery or where nobody was found on one of the memorials. At the base of the headstone, there'd be space for the next of kin to add inscriptions of their own. The cemeteries were to be built to encourage a mood of pantheistic reflection rather than penitence and fear. And three architects, Edwin Lutyens, Sir Herbert Baker, and Sir Reginald Bloomfield were given overall responsibility for creating the cemeteries. In each, it was agreed to be a great war stone inscribed, Their name liveth forevermore, chosen from Ecclesiasticus by Rudyard Kipling. And despite protests from Lutyens, Bloomfield's Cross of Sacrifice, which is the big cross you saw right at the bottom of the screen there, the sword of war sheathed by a cross was also to be included representing a reconciliation between the martial and the Christian. Now, Ovilaire's is the largest cemetery in this district and contains 3,436 British and 120 French graves. It's located in what would have been no man's land in 1916. And of the 3,036 British graves, 2,477 are unidentified. And many of the graves in the cemetery are casualties from the 1st of July, 1916. So the next part of the film utilizes some um, historic footage to show the recruitment of the famous Powell's battalions. Um, and this happened obviously in the UK, but also across the empire, a wave of patriotism said, every man should step up. And the early professional army of 1914, the British Expeditionary Force had suffered very badly. And so they clearly needed new soldiers. Um, and they made a critical, horrible choice, which was to decide to recruit from workplace on the basis that men would fight with their pals uh, rather than fight for the army or fight for a just cause. And so in doing this, they emptied the entire factories, workplaces, and so the men all joined up en masse. They trained together. Of course, they went on to serve together, which meant that on the 1st of July, in certain areas of the Somme, there was very, very heavy concentrations of men coming from certain areas. So if you've heard the stories about the Accrington Pals, the Sheffield Pals, the Leeds Pals, the Newcastle Pals, here is the seeds of the 1st, of 19, 1st July 1916 slaughter was based on this idea of men joining together, training together, fighting together. So of course nobody anticipated the slaughter that was to come. But unsurprisingly, when it came, it devastated communities. And those communities were particularly uh, in Yorkshire, in Lancashire, in the northeast of England. So the north disproportion, even though the London Memorial um, up, at, up at Chetval um, has the, 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 the most names on there, it is the northern regiments and battalions that took the biggest hit um, in and around the 1st of July 1916 and it's just because they, unfortunately they were all crowded to the northern sector of the Somme. So here we see them now fully trained, fully kitted, marching away, laughing and joking. For many of them at this stage it was an excitement, it was an adventure. They hadn't yet reached the front 
Um, and they, they, a lot of them were hoping that the action wouldn't be over by the time they got there. But once they did, and they saw the guns, then I think it becomes real. And this footage of the artillery, you know, is really the key reality of the Western Front, which was simply that the land was pounded and pounded and pounded until nothing could survive, no trees could grow. Of course, the fields became mud baths, the trenches full of water, but it's remorseless smashing the landscape that becomes the battleground that we associate with the Western Front, a featureless landscape that has just been blown to pieces. And of course, these great guns running hour after hour, hundreds of thousands. This is equivalent to the Loch Nagar shell going off 70 feet up into the air. Um, and our next drone footage here is of the Loch Nagar crater. So another form of remembrance in this area is the scars to the landscape that are still visible over a hundred years later. To this day, the Loch Nagar crater is still the largest crater ever made by man in anger anywhere on the planet. So even all these years later, nobody has sought to plant a bigger bomb than exploded here on the 1st of July 1916. So the Loch Nagar crater was created by a large mine placed beneath the German front lines ahead of the first battle of the Somme. It was one of, one of 19 mines that were placed beneath the German lines from the British section of the Somme to assist the infantry to advance at the start of the battle. So there'd been a week of bombardment pounding the German lines in the belief that they would simply rip apart the German defences and that when the time came to attack, the Allied forces would be attacking basically unmanned trenches. This was the idea. So in advance of this, the tunnelling companies, again, many of whom have been mine workers in the north of England, northeast of England, of the Royal Engineers, had dug a shaft about 90 feet deep into the chalk, then excavated some 300 yards under no man's land to place 60,000 pounds or 27 tonnes of explosive into two underground chambers. The aim was to destroy a formidable strong point called the Schwabian Heights on the German front line south of La Boiselle, the village of La Boiselle. And so on Saturday the 1st of July 1916, just before the attack, two minutes before it was due to begin, the mine was exploded, leaving a huge crater 70 feet deep and 330 feet wide. And that's the crater that we can still see to this day. Debris was flung off some mile in the air, and the reason the crater was so large is the chambers were overcharged, meaning sufficient explosive was used not only to break the surface from a crater, but enough to cause spoil to fall the surrounding fields and form a lip around the crater around 15 foot high, which is why it's still there. In effect, it created a rim. And this was designed to protect the advantaging British troops from machine gun fire from the nearby village of La Boiselle. So the crater was captured and held by British troops, but the attack on La Boiselle failed and the mine had not caused serious damage to the German defences, and the attacking British troops suffered 11,000 casualties. So the trench map shows the position of the Sheffield and Accrington Pals on the 1st of July. It's the northernmost section of the line. And here we can see four lines of German fortified trenches, and the red ones, in the front of the village of Sayre, which is to the right of the picture, the four copses, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, um, are, the British trenches run a line in front of the copses. So it's from here the Pals Battalions attack at 7.30am on the 1st of July 1916 to take the village of Sayre. That was their first day objective. So the, uh, the copse that you're seeing, you're about to see in your picture on the right hand side. This is now Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. It's all emerged now into one. Um, so the troops have been told the German trench would be destroyed by the shelling. They'd meet little resistance. So the corpses have now gone. It's a single large wood. The top end of it is called Sheffield. Wood is owned by Sheffield as a memorial to the Sheffield Pals. And to the right of the picture, you can see Luke Copse Cemetery. So we're heading across no man's land, and the Pals battalions would have left their trenches on the right and attacked towards the left. 
they're under strict instruction to walk, not to run. And you can see the land gently slopes up to the left, so critically the Germans have secured the height advantage all the way across this sector. So this cemetery is Queen's Cemetery, and it contains the remains of 311 soldiers, most killed on the 1st of July 1916. And we can see how far they've managed to advance from the trenches. It's a few hundred yards. So right on the distance is the village of Beaumont Hamel, where we're going to be visiting next in this presentation. But following the journey across no man's land to the track on the right follows the path of the British trenches. Small cemetery, Sayre Road number three, contains the remains of 80 soldiers. And in the distance, Sayre Road number two and three contain 9,500 graves between them. Again, most dating from the 1st July 1916. So the cemetery in the middle of their queen, in no man's land, the British trenches, on the left hand side by the cops of the German trenches, to the right of your picture. So you can get in there, you can see how little distance actually covered by the soldiers before they were mowed down and killed that day. So returning along the track, we follow the lines of the British trenches. So Queen Cemetery on the right represents as far as any British soldier advanced on the 1st of July. Um, and we're now looking directly over no man's land, the German trenches on the right, Queen Cemetery in the middle, and the line where the wheat changes direction is the front line of the four rows of those German trenches on the map, the red lines. The German fortification was known as a redoubt, a fortification that was surrounded by trenches and defences on all sides. And the shells and the mines were meant to have destroyed these fortifications. But in actual fact, all that actually done um, was, was have the, that very little impact, really, it's kind of fair to say. The Germans were withdraw, withdrawn to the rear trenches, out of range of the British artillery, and sat out the deluge of shells. When the bombardment stopped, ahead of the British attack, the Germans retook their positions and were ready at their machine gun posts as the British left their trenches. And it's been said since the German defenders could not understand why the British walked upright into gunfire. Why didn't they run? We're now slightly behind the British lines and approaching Luke Cop Cemetery. And this is very unusual as all the graves are lined up facing the direction of the attack on the 1st of July 1916. So at the far end of the cemetery is the Cross of Sacrifice that is found in all British cemeteries. The village of Say you might catch a glimpse of, um, and in front of it is the shadow of the German front line trench. So as we can lift up through, we're looking right across the, the Somme battlefields from the north to the south when we leave this graveyard. But isn't it beautiful? It's so unusual. It's so kind of redolent of them standing parade or standing waiting to attack. It's unique. There's no other graveyard on the Western Front that has this configuration of graves. Two graves together, one behind, two front. You see what I mean? Um, so it really is a kind of unique one. It's kind of loot cops. It's well worth seeking out. As, I mean, any of these are. I mean, they're all incredible to kind of go and see. Um, and what is now, of course, pristine kind of farmland would have been a mass of trenches, row upon row of barbed wire. And of course, you'd have had shell holes absolutely everywhere. So the initial assault on the 1st of July took place here along a line stretching 18 miles. But this northern sector was the deadliest of all, and almost all the 60,000 British casualties on the 1st of July occurred here. Doesn't look it now, does it? You wouldn't be able to tell. But, uh, and for the Accrington Pals, we talked about a little bit earlier, who'd joined up, trained, headed off to France together, been at the base camps, been in the reserve trenches, worked their way to the front, and were in position on the northern sector on the 1st of July, attacking across no man's land on these heavily defended trenches. It was a disaster. And of the 720 men that went into attack, at least 584 were dead, wounded or missing by the end of the first day. In this picture, you're going to see in a moment of the wives, the mothers, the daughters of Accrington. 
I think gives us a very telling image of what happens, the disastrous impact of a policy such as this, when all the men end up disappearing in a day, a whole lost generation in a small mill town. So these women are left without husbands, fathers and sons and the town's fortunes never fully recovered. So as the sun ran on, the roll call of the wounded and the dead increased after each attack. But there's another growing issue, the missing. Soldiers whose bodies could not be found and could not be retrieved from no man's land, either because of the danger or they'd been hidden in the mud, others blown up by explosives. Names were carefully kept and a decision was made that while the war was still running, a memorial to the missing of the Somme was needed. So the Tiepval Memorial of the Missing of the Somme is the largest British war memorial in the world. If you haven't been and you get the opportunity to do so, um, I'd strongly recommend that you do. It is incredibly moving. So again, Sir Edwin Lutyens was called upon to design the monument. It took four years to build and it was unveiled on the 1st of August 1932 by the Prince of Wales, the future Edward VIII, in the presence of the President of France. Now many veterans of the Somme campaign were present on that day, but not all were in uniform. Many veterans had struggled to settle back into civilian life. The trauma, what they'd seen, was too much to process. They struggled back home and many had found themselves drawn back to northern France and the Imperial War Graves Commission provided work for them tending the graves of their fallen colleagues. The memorial itself is 140 feet high and consists of four interlocking arches of different sizes. The arches rest on 16 brick pillars and there is a space for 64 stone panels. And on the 56 panels, the names of 72,316 British and South African men are listed who died in the Somme sector and have no known grave. The London Regiment has the sad honour of having the most names listed on the monument with 4,348. And on the panels which are organised by regiment, there are in total seven Victoria Crosses. Victoria Crosses, of course, being the ultimate accolade for bravery, almost always earned after death. So six of the VCs are British, one South African. Now the British custom is to remove the names of, from the tablets of those who've been identified. So seeing a place where a name has been removed is a good thing. It means one more soldier has a grave, grave with his name on it. Above the panels there are 16 stone laurel wreaths inscribed with the names of the sub-battles that make up the battles of the Somme. Jinchi, Mamets, Woods, Poisier, etc. And a large inscription on the memorial reads here are the names of the officers and men of the British armies who fell on the Somme battlefields from February 1915 to July 1918, but to whom the fortunes of war denied the known and honoured burial given to their comrades in death. So in the winter of 1932-33, we decided to build a small cemetery behind the memorial to represent the losses of both the British and the French during the battles of the Somme. So you can see distinctively the French have crosses. We've seen the British uh, tablet of Portland Stone. So you can build Tunnel Park quite easily. So 300 French and 300 British soldiers were buried at the foot of the memorial. And of those 239 British, um, and 250 free French soldiers are unknown. So again, these are remains of unknown soldiers. The men were all found between December 1931 
and March 1932, in other words, a good, what's that, 13 years, 14 years after the war had finished. Most had died on the Somme, but a number were brought from further afield. And on the cross of sacrifice, the following inscription has been added, that the world may remember the common sacrifice of two and a half million dead. Here have been laid side by side soldiers of France, soldiers of the British Empire in eternal comradeship. Beautiful, isn't it? If you haven't had the chance, you do get the chance to go. There's a remarkable piece. Um, it, it is a wonderful place to go. Harrowing was So we're back to the first 16. So we're now looking at, again, Germans um, in red, British, and green. And we're looking at the ridge, um, which is the one of the Ulster Division. So we're on the first day of the Somme again. Um, and on the top sat the Schwaben Redoubt, which was the big German fortifications. So the continuous red line is the British front line. The green lines are the German defence. Sorry, I got that wrong around. Um, so that's what you're looking at there. So Germans in green, British in red, and that's your front line on the 1st of July. So the Ulster Division actually did spectacularly well and did manage to reach the second line of the German defences. Sadly, however, the division on their left and their right completely failed in their attack, and the Ulstermen had no choice but to withdraw on the same day. Something really rather tragic that the you know the whole thing was so hard fought to secure any ground whatsoever, and that the one battalion that did succeed, the Ulstermen, had to give up their position because they had no support either side of them. So we're going to see the Ulster Memorial uh, engraved. So the Ulster Tower will appear to the left, just in front of the line. Um, and again, it's a mark of the progress the Ulster were made on the 1st of July. The memorial was raised in the late 1920s to commemorate all the um, those who fought and died here. And we're looking in the direction of the Ulster men's advance. The ground rises up from the left to the right and the German positions, so the Ulster Tower right in the middle of the picture there now, the German positions were on the right hand side. We might well see Mill, Rose, uh, Mill Road Cemetery into the distance if you can squint your eyes. I mean they're so close together the cemeteries here. The Schwaben Redoubt was on the high ground just beyond the cemetery and in that cemetery there's the remains of 1300 Commonwealth soldiers so again what you're looking at is a battlefield cemetery of the line of advance, so starting from the Ulster Tower on the left-hand side, that's where they started. The cemetery is as far as most of them were able to secure. So that is, again, the achievement on the 1st of July. But as I say, they had to retreat backwards to the start of their lines, quite literally, their sacrifice was in vain. So panning from the right, you start to see the village of Tiet Velko into view, which is obviously where the missing monument is. And that was attacked by the adjacent division, the Ulstermen. And uh, you might just see the top of the memorial poking up above the tree line as it moves round the drone. So as we turn back towards the north, the folk in the road and the Ulster Tower, the British front line ran just to the left of the road that you can see. The German lines just beyond the cemetery and the Ulster Tower. And on the 1st of July, the Ulster Division lost 5,500 men here, killed, wounded, or missing. The German trenches, you can just about make out as shadows in the wheat. This is a landscape that has memory. Now, the Ulstermen were another Pals battalion that had initially formed as a Unionist militia to protest against home room for Ireland. On the first day of the Somme was the anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne, a fact remarked upon by the leader of the division. And stories have often been told that some men wore orange sashes into battle, while others wore orange ribbons. And there's a story that when some of his men went wavered, one company commander from West Belfast, Major George Gaffikin, took off his orange sash, held it high for his men to see, and roared the traditional battle cry of the Boyne, Come on boys, no surrender. On the 1st of July, 
following preliminary bombardment, the Ulstermen quickly took the German front line. But intelligence was so poor that with the rest of the division attacking under a creep bombardment, which is artillery fired in front of or over men, they advanced and they advanced it moves. The Ulstermen would have come under attack from their own bombardment uh, in the German first line. So it was a real mess. But they advanced, moving to the crest so rapidly the Germans had no time to come up for the dugouts that were generally 30 to 40 feet below ground. Um, and it was the Schwaben readout, uh, this part of it here, was taken. So, so successful was the uh, the advance that by 10 o'clock, some had reached the German second line. But again, they came under the barrage of their own troops, their own artillery. Um, the barrage wasn't due to finish until 10.10. So, the successful penetration had to be given up before nightfall, as it was unmatched by those at its flanks. The Ulstermen were now exposed to a narrow salient, open to attack on three sides. They were running out of ammunition and supplies, and a full German counterattack at 22 o'clock, 10 o'clock, forced them to withdraw, giving up virtually everything that they gained. Of the nine Victoria Crosses awarded on the first day of the Somme, four went to soldiers of the Ulster Division. And this ground will still contain many of the bodies that fell on that day. The, uh, the cemetery you were looking at, there was Connaught, opened in 1917. There's 1,200 soldiers there, and it continues to receive new remains as they're discovered, generally doing ploughing um, through farmers. So on the horizon, Beaumont Hamel. So there is now, go and visit the famous Beaumont Hamel. So the War Office and the British Army were so confident of success ahead of the Battle of the Somme, they sent a film for camera crews to film the attack. So the soldiers saw they were relaxing minutes before the attack. They believed the seven-day bombardment had smashed the German defences. They could not know what was about to happen. So the village of Beaumont Hamel, I mean, you picture there, was an objective for the first day of the Somme, but actually took three months before it was captured with a terrific loss of life. So we're coming over no man's land towards the German front lines. The little circular woodland area that you can see is actually a huge shell hole. Um, it's known as Hawthorne Ridge Crater. And the cemetery just near is the Hawthorne Ridge Cemetery. You can sort of see the shape of the crater. But this is not the crater itself. It's actually completely overgrown. So above the crater had sat the Hawthorne Ridge Redoubt, a powerfully fortified German machine gun position sticking out into no man's land, meaning the Germans could fire not just the front, but also to the left and to the right. And as we begin to swing around to the right, we're going to get our first views of what is now called Newfoundland Park that contains the best preserved trenches on the Somme battlefield. So we're looking along the front lines with the British to the right and Newfoundland Park, let me come into your picture, is outlined by a ring of trees. And as we move in, you might begin to see the shape of what's called Y Ravine. The paths cutting across this enclosed space form the shape of a Y. So it is known as Y Ravine. And this was the location of the Newfoundland Regiment. So Beaumont Hamel is to the rear, and the German communication trenches were located here. The trenches that ran behind the line and were used for running messages to the front line. See the Y shape in, your, in the picture there? Um, so we can now see the German front line trench just in front of the trees in the foreground. You can see a couple of memorials but not the shape of the trenches. Trenches were never built in straight lines because if a shell landed in it, a blast would run the whole length of the trench, taking out a lot of people. And also if an enemy machine gun had got into the trench, they could fire it along the trench. So consequently, there was always a zigzag um, to kind of limit the damage that could be done on any one section. And so as we kind of pan up, you should be able to start to see the Y shape, uh, the kind of two paths coming together, which is where the communication trench and the main trench meet. And again, we're looking across no man's land. You should be able to see the line of the Newfoundland trench towards the top of your picture. There's a memorial coming in to view. 
There's actually a lone tree in the centre towards the top of the picture. And this tree is as far as the Newfoundlanders ever got. It's actually behind their own front line. As the Newfoundlanders moved out from the clump of trees at the top, along the top of the picture, on the 1st of July 1916, the planned route was via the communication trenches, but they found them blocked up with the wounded. So someone gave the fatal order for the Newfoundlanders to leave the communication trench and move over open land. They were on a deadline. They were due to be in the next wave of the attack and they didn't want to miss the deadline. Tragically, this was in broad daylight, in full view of the German machine gunners, and we can see shell holes everywhere. And the second trench is now very clear. Right in the centre coming into the picture, the Newfoundland Memorial. And as we pan around the Canadian cemetery to the left, we're looking towards Beaumont Hamel and moving in the direction the Newfoundlanders would have tried to advance. The Newfoundlanders suffered 97% casualties before reaching their own front line. And that was on the first day of the Somme. The Newfoundland Memorial Park was built on land over which the 1st Battalion of the Newfoundland Regiment fought on the 1st of July 1916. The 1st Battalion Newfoundland Regiment were part of the 29th Division. They went over the top at 9.15 on the 1st of July 1916. At the beginning of the attack, they were 800 strong. The following morning, at roll call, only 68 men were present, most of them from a small reserve held at the back. The casualties suffered by the Newfoundland Regiment on July the 1st were the worst of any unit involved in fighting on that fateful day, the worst day in British military history. Um, and the Caribou Memorial, the sorry, a minute ago, lists 809 names, and it's without doubt one of the most beautiful monuments on the battlefield. So we're now at the Lorette Spur, and we're actually now looking at the French and German trenches at the, the bottom of the economy, how close they are together. And this is um, far and away the largest of the French graveyards in the French sector on the southern end of the battlefield. Um, so the trenches just to the right there. And this was very unusual. You see the white rectangles, they are huge burial pits. Um, and this is a vast grave. There's 40,000 graves here altogether. And unlike the British graves, they go back to back. So each row that you're looking at actually is two graves, one facing, one coming away. Um, but what's again is fascinating is, is if you've not been to this area, you're just seeing how it mixes with the agriculture around you. You've got these kind of formal laid out graveyards, but all around as far as the eye can see is agricultural fields. Um, but there's something incredibly moving about the cemetery. As you swing round, we see these rectangles. I say they're mass graves. The seven mass graves in total hold over 20,000 French soldiers. And in total, there are the bodies and remains of over 40,000 French soldiers here, which represent about half the total of the French deaths in taking this piece of high ground near Vimy Ridge from the Germans. It is absolutely mesmerising, I think, when you can just sort of take in what we call these sort of silent cities of the dead. And what's amazing is just next to it is, is a brand new installation, um, which is quite staggering. It's a new circular monument. It was involved for the, for the centenary. It's called the Ring of Remembrance. And the giant plaques are covered here with the names of Alpes Lauder, irrespective of nationality or Germans, French, Canadians, Americans, everybody who was there. So French, German, British, Canadian names are listed together here for the first time. This is not a list for the whole First World War or even the entire Western Front. This is just a memorial for people that died in the Pas de Calais department. It doesn't include the missing, it doesn't include the wounded, just those with no known graves 
in this small corner of northern France. And there are over 590,000 names on the Ring of Remembrance. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Vimy Ridge, the Canadian Memorial. Quite this beautiful. See how the shell holes have pockmarked the earth a hundred years later. from a place called Douai. This is uh, quite an uh, industrial area, as well as farming. You have um, coal slag heaps. Beautiful geometry. sector you have some of the um, the best preserved trenches that have been restored um, but the Canadian trenches um, at both Beaumont Hamel and Vimy Ridge are a, a fantastic way if you want to get in and, uh, and experience as far as possible um, life in the trenches then, then both here and Beaumont Hamel are definitely the best to go and of course if you have Canadian roots or, or connections, and these are sacred places um, and, and, and wonderfully preserved, and you'd be incredibly welcome. So, again, it's all restored, but it just gives that sense of what we're talking about there um, of how the, 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 the trenches don't run in straight lines, they are kinked to prevent um, too much damage. If a, if a shell, a grenade, a machine gun comes in. Crater is emerging there into the centre of your picture on the exploding shell. So it really is a landscape that is scarred by this memory. It's never got over the trauma of what happened here. Nobody has really tried to do anything other than treat it as a place of memory, of remembrance, of sacrifice, of loss. 
and with the hope that from that comes learning, redemption, forgiveness.
So coming into Tynecourt Cemetery now, we've crossed over in Belgium, the top end of the uh, Ypres salient. And this is a receiving cemetery. They're still discovering bodies and interring them here. It is um, the largest cemetery on the Western Front. And it's what being described from the, the, the silent cities of the dead. Until you've been to Tynecourt, you can't quite take in the size and scale of this place. It looks like a regimental army, and of course, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, if you weren't already aware, these graveyards are pristine. When they said, they shall not grow old, they meant it physically, metaphysically, spiritually, representationally. Insofar as this Portland stone looks like it could have been put in yesterday. There's no weeds, no stray plants. Nature is subdued here. It's not allowed to take over. Even the bird song is notable by its absence. So when you visit these trees, the first thing you're struck by is the order of it. And of course, rather than this being a graveyard of people of advanced years, the end of their years, of course, we're reading 19, 22, 25, 27. It's wrong. It's artificial. It's inhuman. It's a graveyard full of youth, but a youth that is not allowed to age. They shall not grow old. This is what they meant. This is what remembrance looks like. An army, gardeners, and land management staff cooperated between the British, the French, and the Belgian governments keep these graveyards, these cemeteries, these places of sacrifice and remembrance in utterly pristine condition. So we become simply overwhelmed because there is nothing, there's no parallel, there's nothing prepared you for this. It's not like a graveyard. It is a representation of an army that has gone. The markers are in its place. And it's when we finally look upon these formations, we get a scale of the loss, of the sacrifice. And there's something, I think, very difficult for us about the First World War, because for those that haven't perhaps studied it, perhaps read much about it, is there's a tendency to conflate it with the Second War, with the moral uh, dimension of you know, defeating Nazism, fight for freedom, and, and there isn't really a moral dimension to the First War. It's a war of empires where the price that was paid was in the flesh of the young, those that died, those that were horrendously injured, those that came back were never the same, and on their families and their loved ones. So here we are, just before the film cameras, just before they're about to go over top, the 1st July 1916.